इस ब्लूमबर्ग यू टीवी Hello there this is Talk Back I'm Hindol Sen Gupta returning on my show to talk about why Copenhagen failed as promised here's Dr RK Pachauri Dr Pachauri thanks very much indeed for being on the show Sir the question is being asked that here's a conference that will fail why did the world see this conference at all what was achieved by all these people heads of states gathering together if it was already a predetermined failure well i don't think it was a predetermined failure because after all it was the end of a process which had been going on for 2 years beginning with bali and the expectation was that we would get an agreement a binding agreement of course before um, the conference itself it became clear that enough homework enough agreement had not taken place for any kind of binding commitments but the expectation was that we would at least get a strong political agreement and i think that's precisely why so many heads of government and heads of state descended on copenhagen and i must say at the end of the day uh, there is disappointment there's much left to be done but at least we've got something which is in the nature of a framework not universally accepted by all the countries but at least by some of the key countries in the world on the basis of which i hope we can build a solid agreement before the next meeting in mexico when we all saw heads of states disagreeing fervently and actually in some senses some critics have argued going back to their original position the flexibility that allows conferences like these summits like these to move forward on an issue as vital as climate change just did not happen are you hopeful now in future there will be some flexibility some move forward or has that in, has this uh, summit in some senses given vital clear warnings that the world is unable to agree on a critically damaging thing well i think uh, i wouldn't go to the extent of saying that the world is unable or incapable of agreeing to something as important as meeting the threat of climate change but i would say that given the record of what has happened since 1992 when the un framework convention on climate change came into existence the time has come for civil society and grassroots efforts to really take things into their own hands because unless that happens firstly we're not going to get the kind of results that we're looking for on a scientific basis uh, so that you know the climate of this planet can be stabilized and secondly uh, leaders and governments are not going to get a clear signal that people want them to act and i really think climate change now has to enter the agenda of political parties and therefore it has to be based on grassroots demands uh, there is need to revive that kind of effort on a wide scale across the globe most definitely in the developed countries in some senses we saw deep rooted polarization in copenhagen the west versus the east like never before and critically damaged countries who fear for their very existence as in the island nations raising in one voice perhaps for the first time and saying you guys cannot fight anymore our livelihood our, our countries by themselves are at risk that sort of polarization what does it suggest to you for the future well i think what it suggests basically is the fact that you know for much too long we have taken for granted some of the worst victims of climate change as you rightly said unfortunately the small island states our own neighbor bangladesh several of the african nations are extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change whether you talk about water stress uh, impacts on agricultural productivity the uh, extension of the desert and the way it's growing and certainly uh, extreme events which are growing in intensity and frequency like floods droughts heat waves extreme precipitation events all of these are going to have a major impact across the globe but the ones who are going to be most vulnerable are the ones who don't have the economic means the infrastructure or the capacity to be able to deal with these impacts so you know for much too long the voices of these nations these communities have not been heard and we saw for the first time some of these nations really rising and showing their anger their frustration 
and it will get much worse. And therefore, I think it's important for the global community to understand we are all members of Spaceship Earth. Let me ask you a question that some people are beginning to ask. You know, we used to talk about water wars in India. Is Copenhagen the beginning in some senses, if one were to take an extreme point of view, the beginning of climate wars? Well, the beginning has actually taken place much earlier. Uh, the fact is that, you know, with this concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere, we have a certain inertia in the whole system by which climate change will continue for several decades. Even if we bring down emissions to uh, the level where we are today and don't allow them to increase in the future. The fact is the problem is already there, but we're compounding it by delaying action. We're compounding it by not reducing emissions as quickly as we should. And we're certainly compounding it by not providing assistance at an adequate level for these countries, which are going to be the worst sufferers. So what we find today is certainly uh, a cry of despair, a cry of anger on the part of those who are going to be the worst victims. And we better be aware of that because certainly in some of these societies, there will be conflict, there will be war over hunger, uh, malnutrition, over lack of water. And clearly we are only delaying the problem, but certainly not solving it. Then let me ask you, a lot of people believe, and we have seen for the first time, widespread protest, if localized protest, against Obama, even in his own country, about his role or his inefficiency in taking a, a stand on U.S. cuts on uh, emissions on climate change. Candidate Obama versus President Obama. Is that true, Dr. Pachauri? Do you feel that, that President Obama, as opposed to candidate Obama, is closer on climate change to President Bush than we earlier believed? You see, President Obama is between the devil and the deep sea. Uh, you must remember that the right wing and several vested interests, including industrial lobbies, are overactive at this point of time to block anything uh, that involves action on climate change. I believe there's been a 300% increase right. in the number of lobbyists that have been hired to block anything to do with climate change policy or legislation in the last one year. Uh, there are 770 companies that are involved in this effort and well over 2,000 lobbyists. That makes almost three lobbyists per each, each member of Congress. And currently, I think the most important thing that he has in his hands is to get legislation through the Senate, which has been introduced by Senators Kerry and uh, Boxer. And therefore, you know, I'm not at all supporting what he's done, because I personally think he should have started much earlier in his fight on climate change. But placed as he is right now, he perhaps couldn't have done very much more. If he had tried anything more than what he's committed, uh, you could have said that this legislation in the Senate would be uh, as, dead, as dead as a duck in water. I don't think we should uh, get carried away with the euphoria of the understanding that we had over there. Even in the field of climate change, let's face it, India and China are in two different leagues.